Uh, Chris Coker, will you please come introduce today's speaker? Hello, and I'd, I'd like to pile on a little bit uh, personally about the Ukraine crisis. Um, Viktor Serbolov is the CEO of the YMCA's and lives in Kiev, and um, he's been riding back and forth, and we have not been able to contact him since last night. Uh, two weeks ago, we sent them $5,000 to turn into cash so that the staff of the YMCA could get out of the cities or wherever they were if they needed to. So please keep the YMCA in your thoughts and prayers because I'm thinking they need it right now. Um, Dr. Janine Davidson, our speaker today. Janine Davidson is president of the Metro State University in Denver. It's Colorado's third largest and most diverse public university. I happen to have the privilege of teaching there um, once a year, and I can tell you that it is exceptionally enjoyable and the students are wonderful. They're people who I would love to get to work with on a regular basis. Davidson is a national thought leader in higher education and on topics such as public service, U.S. foreign policy, and national security. She's taught at George Mason University, Georgetown, Davidson College, and other professional military schools, and was an aviation and aerobatics flight instructor at the U.S. Air Force Academy, which they don't just let any scrub go in there and do that. You've got to be pretty good, right? <laughs> Prior to joining MSU Denver, Dr. Davidson served in various senior civilian Pentagon positions, most recently as the 32nd Undersecretary of the United States Navy. Davidson is a National Association of Public Administrations Fellow and a life member of the Council of Foreign Relations. She served as the presidentially appointed commissioner for the National Commission on Military and National Public Service. Lastly, Dr. Davidson earned her bachelor's degree in architectural engineering from the University of Colorado in Boulder and her master's and doctorate in international studies from the University of South Carolina. It is our privilege to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your ridiculously busy schedule to be with us. the Air Force hymn, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank you for that introduction. I really uh, appreciate that. I appreciate being here today on this beautiful but chilly day. I also really appreciate the outpouring um, for what's happening in Ukraine. I've done, a, I've done some media on that in the last couple days, and um, I'm happy to take some questions about that situation, what we think is going on there at the end. If you're keen to talk about it, um, NATO, what the heck is going on, military stuff, whatever. Um, but that's not why I was invited here today. I was invited here today because of what I do now as president of MSU Denver. So I want to give you a little overview of um, sort of how I came to be here leading this amazing university and a little bit about what's going on, uh, a little bit about my university, of course, because, you know, that's my whole purpose in life, is to promote MSU Denver. But also to give you a sense of what's going on in higher ed in general, and also what's going on in higher ed in Colorado. And then again, um, more interested in what you want to know about, and so I'll leave a lot of room for questions. But I'm what's considered sort of a non-traditional president. I did not come through the, I, I have been a professor, but I didn't come through the ranks, um, dean, provost, that kind of thing, had no higher ed administration experience. Um, I came through the other side, I came through um, national security world, flying airplanes, as um, Chris pointed out, and then transitioning into um, quite a few different positions in the Pentagon. Um, what happened was I basically got fired uh, by the American people when um, President Trump got elected. All of the Obama people get, you know, thrown out. Um, and I uh, was thinking about what, what should I do with my life next. I um, really stumbled on this opportunity 
because I knew I wanted to do something mission driven. I didn't want to just go back to think tank or the classroom. Um, and they were looking for a new president at MSU Denver. So I came out here and I, I, I interviewed and I didn't really know what was going on with MSU Denver, you know, because I, I went to the University of Colorado Boulder um, back in the 80s and I remember little, little Metro State um, in uh, Denver at the time, but I did not know very much about it. Um, what happened was I came out to interview for the job and just absolutely fell in love with it. I fell in love with the people and their passion and part of the reason why they're so passionate is because of the mission of MSU Denver, what it does and who we serve. Um, MSU Denver is the only, first of all, it's a, what's called a regional comprehensive university. So full on undergraduate, graduate programs. Um, in, you can major in just about everything from philosophy to flying. Um, it's also what's called an access institution. So it's the only university in the state that is designated by law as an open access institution. What that means is um, anybody can come to MSU Denver. And, and that's really important, and I know Marty and I were talking about K-12 education in America, um, which is pretty uneven, wouldn't you say? And so, you know, places like MSU Denver are the place where it's not your fault that you grew up in a, diff in a zip code. You, like, have no choice in the matter and went to uh, a high school that wasn't exactly college prep. Or it wasn't necessarily your fault that your parents decided to immigrate um, undocumented uh, to this country when you were three and now you're undocumented. It doesn't matter uh, any, where you come from, you can come to MSU Denver and you can get in if you have a GED or um, a high school degree. And that really, really matters because it, it is the great American equalizer. It is like the engine room for the American dream. And what you learn when you're working and teaching like Chris does at um, MSU Denver is that um, some students are more prepared than others because of where they may have come from or because of the educational attainment of their own parents. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're smarter, better, or less capable. And that's what's pretty amazing. We, had, we have students every year that um, come from very humble beginnings and walk across that stage never thinking that it was ever going to happen. Um, students like, you know, coming from an area where they were, weren't college prep, they had to take remedial math. Um, we have an alum who, who this happened to, had to work his way through school. Like most of our students, 80% of our students work 30 to 40 hours a week while they're going to school, which I'll come back to, is a bit of an issue. Um, but he had to take this remedial, he was working full time, it took him like six years to graduate, and he finally did graduate, and now he's one of the top cancer doctors at Johns Hopkins University in the, in the country. That is what is possible because of our public education system in this country. And it's a system that's a bit under threat. Um, it, has, it does amazing things, but it also um, gets harder and harder to do it every year. So um, MSU Denver is that kind of place. Um, we're also what's known as an HSI, a Hispanic Serving Institution. Um, that's a federal designation based on um, how many Latino, Hispanic identifying students that we have, which is the fastest growing population in Colorado. 50% uh, of students in the Denver public schools are now Hispanic. It's, it's growing like crazy. So we're a Hispanic serving institution. Gives us access to some federal funding that helps all of our students, which is, which is a great thing. Um, so just this year, about 50% of our students are students of color. 58% of our students are the first in their family to ever go to college. And that is like one of the coolest things. And when you come to graduation, and you're all welcome to come to our graduation, we um, do it in the Coliseum um, for a reason, because we don't want to tell graduates that they can only bring one or two family members. And so they bring the whole fam family and it's there and it's, it's it, a huge celebration when you see that kid walk across the stage and like 10 people in their family um, applaud and they're the first in their family to go to college. We also have um, the median age for students at MSU Denver is 25. Um, and what that means is, you know, only about 35% of our students are first time, full time freshmen right out of high school. The rest are coming in different parts of their lives. They're working adults, they're coming back. Um, the, the student experience today across the country is actually more like the MSU student experience than, than the Boulder student experience that you're all probably very familiar with that I went through. Four years in the dorm, in the apartment, 
Our students come, they go, they stop, they start, they're working, and that's just um, the nature of higher education um, today. So um, it's, higher education is different for students today than it was um, for, for us. For, for, for one thing, this is kind of an interesting thing, um, students really care about getting jobs. Parents, grandparents, I'm sure like you think, duh. Well, actually, um, you know, there was a Gallup poll a few years back that surveyed college students all over the country, and it turns out that, you know, 85% of them said that they're in college, quote, to get a better job. And we all said, yeah, that's, of course. But actually, when they, when they used to ask that question in the 60s and 70s and, you know, in the beginnings of our modern, um, you know, post-World War II um, higher education system, the answer, the top answer was usually to gain a more meaningful understanding of life. And I actually think those things aren't mutually exclusive. I think you have to do both. But what it says is that there's a more sense of practical, uh, practicality in our students today. Um, it also says that a lot, that um, higher education is, has become um, accessible to so many other people. I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, it was the, a privileged set of Americans that got to go to college. And so gaining a more meaningful understanding of life was an important thing to do because if you're gonna go and run dad's company, it's gonna all be fine. It's not like that today. And so higher education today in MSU Denver, one of the things we really focus on is connecting students to that career portfolio. Um, you know, you might remember, <laughs> you might remember the scandal a few years back uh, of those wealthy people trying to sneak their kids in the side doors of, you know, USC and spending like $500,000 and risking jail time. And uh, you think, why would they do that? You know, when, when, when the quality of education at a school like MSU Denver is, I would put it up against um, any place I've taught, Davidson College, Georgetown, USC, any of those places. And I think the reason why they do it is not necessarily, I'll tell you that's the dirtiest secret of higher ed, is not about what's happening in the classroom. Because what's happening in the classroom at those big, huge schools is um, a, a lesser experience than what's happening in a, in the, in a smaller school. Um, it's because of the network that they think they're going to meet, right? And the social strata that they're going to run around with, the network. A bunch of us college prof um, professors and chancellors went out to visit LinkedIn a couple years ago, and they have all this really cool data, um, metadata even, to, uh, about what's going on in the workforce. And they said that um, two things. One, they said there, there's not really a, a talent gap in this country. There's a network gap where there's all these students at these other sorts of universities, but they're not getting noticed by these big employers because they just don't know the right people. And so LinkedIn is trying to like, how can we fix that, you know? The other thing they said was, and this is one of my favorite <laughs> statistics, something like 65% of entry level jobs for people with bachelor's degrees require three years of experience. A little bit of well, how does that work, right? It's part of the reason why your kids go to college for four years and then come back to your living room or your, you know, to your guest room because they don't. If they haven't had an opportunity to have an internship, apprenticeship, some sort of a co-op, something that they're doing while they're working or while they're going to school, they're going to graduate with a transcript but with no resume, and that's not a cool thing. So um, understanding those two dynamics is like the sweet spot for MSU Denver. Um, it's why I started the Classroom to Career Hub at MSU because um, I want it, it's my goal that every single student will have the opportunity to have um, an internship, an apprenticeship, some sort of a paid working experience that is related to what they want to do in their life and that they will also get robust career counseling so they will try to figure out what that thing is that they want to do in their life and so that their academic credits are aligned towards that. <clears throat> so many students change their major two and three times because they haven't figured that out. So that's the pathway that we're trying to work on. When I went to college, um, you know, you, you kind of took a couple classes your freshman year and then you sort of figured it out. Maybe this is kind of something that happened to you guys. Um, then you chose your major, and then you got an advisor. And the advisor's job was to get you to sequence all your classes so that you could graduate on time and get out. Um, 
But what if you chose the wrong major? So now you have to start over again. If you're lucky, maybe your junior or senior year, if there's a career center, you may sort of saunter in there with your resume and try to have somebody help you. But it's very unusual. Um, not exactly career focused. What we're trying to do instead is have that career mentality sort of baked in um, from when you get there. So helping you choose that major, thinking about it along the way, making sure that um, the classroom environment, whether it's um, engineering, which is obvious, or history or philosophy, are talking to you about what kinds of things you can do in the world with those kinds of degrees. Many of you parents tell your students not to study things like history and philosophy and political science. But there are great jobs <laughs> in those fields. Um, and we need people in those fields. Um, I would say that it's not necessarily the science that we're getting wrong in the world right now. It's the politics and the ethics and those sorts of things and a sense of history and pattern analysis so that you can solve these problems like climate change or a global pandemic or hey, what's this algorithm on Facebook gonna do to the war in Syria? <laughs> so those are the sorts of things that we need a holistic um, set of um, graduates for our civil society. And those are the kinds of things that you can do if you think about careers from the beginning in your curriculum. And then along the way, making sure that everyone has an opportunity to um, work. So one of the programs that we really want to scale is a program that we have with Lockheed Martin. So um, you're around your junior or senior year at MSU Denver, if you're in this program, you take a reduced credit hour load so that you can work 20 hours a week on site paid at Lockheed Martin. It's called a co-op. It's different than an internship, which is less work. And um, that work experience also gives you academic experience towards your, or credit towards your degree. And um, those students are doing real things. They're helping build real spaceships and things. And um, Lockheed's hired like 80 or 90% of the folks, uh, the students that have gone through that program. And this, the, the employers love it, and I spoke to one of the employers today in here who says he loves hired during MSU grad. Um, they love it because, why? You, number one, they get, you get to sort of try before you buy these students, right? Um, but number two, they say, um, they love that program because they helped us design the curriculum and they also teach in the program. So it's about employers getting left of the timeline of graduation before in, in being part of um, the academic experience and the journey um, of our students. So we do a lot of things like that. That's, that's our primary focus. Um, and again, you can major in anything. Um, and I love it. It's the coolest job ever. It's hard. <laughs> It's, it's, it's long hours, um, it's super rewarding. A friend of mine uh, who was a retired admiral, uh, four-star admiral, Bill McRaven, when he retired, he went and ran the University of Texas and retired after three years and told his board in his final presentation that being a college president is the hardest job in the world. And this guy was a Navy SEAL. <laughs> He's like the guy that planned the thing that got bin Laden. And you think, wow, you know, I wrote him a note and I said, now you tell me, you know. And he said, yes, it's the hardest job, but it's the most rewarding. And he's right about that. But let me tell you um, a couple of reasons why it's hard. Um, number one reason why it's hard, and I kind of already hit on this, is the narrative. What's, what people say about higher education. I mean, it's really hard to run an institution that is as amazing as I just described with the kinds of students and the life-changing experiences that higher education provides. When there's the Wall Street Journal and Forbes magazine and uh, New York Times and everybody else up on Capitol Hill and everywhere saying that higher ed sucks, basically. Excuse my language. But they do. They say it's out of touch, it's expensive, it's bloated, all you people don't know what you're doing. Um, and it, debt's going crazy. Um, and you know, like every good conspiracy theory, it's partly true, but not totally true. Like not true much at all in Colorado. <laughs> um, we're not completely out of touch as I just described. We're really trying to get the next generation to be the leaders in the business, and so, business community and civil society that we know that they need to be. Um, are there debates on the left and the right in 
in higher ed? Are some schools really um, too liberal and some too conservative? Yeah, sure. It's America. And we have free speech in America and it's always going to be like that. And this is, it's at the university level where those debates are supposed to be taking place. And we really try to promote that at MSU Denver. In fact, my general counsel and I taught a class two semesters um, on free speech, particularly because of that reason, because it's kind of under attack. Um, but this idea that it's gotten too expensive. Now, I want to dig into this just a little bit. Um, just by the nature of the Rotary Club, I know most of you are college graduates. Any of you go to a public university? Okay, me too. Um, so at a public universities, back when I was in college in the 80s, and uh, even in the 70s and the 90s, um, some of us kind of had scholarships or worked our way through school with a part-time job. How many of you had a summer job or a part-time job? Worked your way through school. Um, actually, you didn't really work your way through school if you went to a public university. You had an angel investor called the state. The state paid 70% of the cost of your education, of my education back in the day. Today they pay 20%. That is the reason why the price of college has gone up. Because the price, has, the cost, differentiate cost from price. The price has gone up for the student because the cost has been shifted to the student. We have decided collectively or accidentally in this nation that public higher education, meh, it's maybe it's more of a private good than we thought. Maybe we did that accidentally. I kind of think we did, kind of hope we did. Um, I don't know if we can turn it around, but that's the number one myth that is out there. The reason college is more expensive for your kids and your grandkids is not because we're just like, spending like crazy and we don't know how to run these places. In fact, Colorado has a rating as one of, as the top most efficient state when it comes to running these institutions because we're not funded uh, very well and we're trying like crazy to keep the tuition down. There are a couple things that have driven up the cost. So if I had been a college professor back in the 80s or the 90s, um, I wouldn't have to fund things like mental health services at the level that we do today. So there's a huge mental health crisis in this country of, with students. And like any of you who are business members, you know the cost of health care itself has fallen on businesses, and that's a great driver. When I was in college, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have websites. We didn't have any of that IT backbone that cost a lot of money to run, um, whether it's cybersecurity or websites that need to be accessible to blind people, actually. That is a law, it costs a lot of money. And then the massive like, accretion over time of regulations. Marty and I were talking about all the regulations that, and, uh, that run rural higher education. So those are costs that have gone up, but they still pale in comparison to the fact that the state of Colorado has decided to defund higher education. Um, I wanna leave some room for um, questions. So I'll just um, finish out with a little bit more about um, what's going on in Colorado, because I know people, I love talking to the Rotary because you're so um, usually very engaged in what's going on and aware. Um, but some people don't really know that Colorado ranks 48th in the nation in how we fund our higher education per student. It's a, it's a race that we're winning, a race to the bottom that I'm not proud of. And it's another thing that makes my job really hard in the all about us category. But honestly, it is not something that Colorado should be proud of. And it's very hard to turn around um, because of Tabor and because of this narrative. Um, I really would like to see Colorado lift its game. You see, you see in the media that we have the, one of the highest, most, most highly educated workforce but those people come from other places. They've moved here from other states. And it's our own students that we're leaving behind. And so um, if I have any ask for you, it would be that, to pay attention at how we're funding our K-12 and our higher ed in this state, because it is the seed corn for our future. And um, we need to be competitive economically, and we need to have um, a vibrant civil society. So on the upside, higher education, uh, another one of the 
negative narratives is that not everybody needs to go to college, right? You hear that a lot. Not everybody, college isn't for everybody, right? That's what I think people tell other people's kids. <laughs> it's not what you tell your kids. I can guarantee it. And the reason it's not what you tell your kids is because if you have a higher education credential, especially if you have a bachelor's degree, you are going to make at least seven figures more, seven, um, I think the number is a million dollars more over the course of your life. You are um, much less likely to suffer health issues. You're much less likely, um, more likely to save for um, retirement. You're definitely going to be more better off um, uh, monetarily, but you're also going to be, which is all good things for you, but it's also better for society. Turns out people with a higher education degree are 4.7 times less likely to go to jail. Not trivial, um, we spend 10 times more per prisoner than we do per student in this state. So that's kind of an investment cycle that's upside down if you ask me. Um, if you have a higher education degree, you're more likely to join the Rotary Club, you're more likely to um, engage in other uh, community events, you're more likely to vote, you're more likely to be a vibrant member of civil society and to volunteer. So, hooray for higher education and hooray for MSU Denver and thank you so much for inviting me to tell you about it. I think I have some time for questions, right? Yeah. Thank you for the very engaging presentation. Um, one of my questions is, obviously there's a focus on being kind of relevant to the job scene now, but as you also mentioned, it's very, very important. I mean, yeah, I, I, what our society needs now are people that have kind of the standards and, and there's whole other kinds of things. So do you have a core curriculum that kind of goes along with uh, kind of the you know, specific job related curriculum? Um, we do have core requirements. Uh, what, we, what we actually are working on doing even more of is um, in, in order to sort of, I don't know if this gets exactly to your question, in order to, to eliminate this, this, this bouncing around majors is to have a set of core requirements associated with sort of a category of things. So if you know you're interested in something science oriented or engineering oriented, at least your your basic beginning courses while you figure it out and while you do some of that career exploration will not be completely out of whack. Um, and then if you say you're interested in law or politics or liberal arts, it's the same sort of thing. And then we have a lot of health professions. It's another big area. So that's kind of what we do. There's a, there's a through th thread. Um, uh, of requirements associated with um, like cultural studies and language and English and, and math and, and those sorts of things um, as well. Which, because to my great sadness and dismay, um, history is one of the least popular majors today, which is a bummer for all the reasons I described. Um, but there are some core history requirements that are required, so it's actually one of the most um, highest credit hour production, if you will, in that department. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, a week after Trump was elected in 2016, I was listening to Colorado Public Radio, and the woman from Colorado Springs who had been elected, whatever it is, the head of uh, public education, this is uh, on, on not higher education in Colorado, was asked the question, what is the biggest problem that you need to solve? I thought she was going to say, well, there are teachers in the mountains making $22,000 a year. But no, she said the biggest problem that she needed to address is that too many students in Colorado were being taught the homosexual lifestyle. And I'm just, so my first question is, does that kind of thinking still exist? <laughs> Secondly, I read in the paper the other day that Colorado was one of a few states where if you had any student debt outstanding, you couldn't get your transcript that would enable you to go to graduate school or, or if your employer wanted it. Is that true? And if it is, is anything being done to uh, undo such vile behavior? <laughs> You'll be happy with both my answers. Um, I can't speak to Colorado Springs. I did live there once, and I'm sure there are plenty of people who still feel that way. But um, 
I think that it's changed a lot. Um, our university has uh, one of the largest LGBTQ like student life clubs, whatever, we have a special graduation. Um, and I think we just, was it 1992 when Colorado was labeled the hate state? Yeah, and so it's been since then to now that um, MSU Denver, actually the whole Auraria campus, which is shared with CCD and UCD, um, has one of the oldest and um, most robust, uh, let's now it's 30 years, LGBTQ um, student life. And so we're kind of proud of that. Um, and uh, your other question, oh, yeah, you know, it's been forever and all time. Um, if you uh, had an overdue library book or, which happened to me when I was trying to graduate, <laughs> Um, to hold up your transcript or a bill that hasn't been paid, they'll hold up your transcript. And um, there's actually a bill in the state house right now that's trying to get rid of that. And most of us think it's fine. Um, you know, so of course that's going to leave some money on the table for some of you, um, you know, delinquent students who aren't paying their final bills, but uh, uh, that's what that's all about, if that answers your question. Yeah. And I did have a library book that one of my roommates had taken and then I wasn't going to graduate. It was a bad thing. Uh, we have a question online with uh, John Sullivan. Hi, uh, Dr. Davidson. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, one of the things that has um, confused me for years is Colorado has long had a very highly educated population vis-a-vis uh, -vis other states in the United States. And can you explain why with a population with that credential, the state doesn't do more to fund higher education? Sure. Um, well, the first, the first part of that is the paradox, which is um, the, the numbers, the, we do have one of the highest, if not the highest, um, high, most educated population, um, but most of those student, most of those professionals have come from other places. I don't have to tell anybody in this room how much the front range has grown in population in the last 20, in 20 years. So that's what's sort of driving that um, in the last 15 to 20 years. Well, remember that the Tabor Law was passed in 1992 or four, it's a great time frame. Tabor has really made it really difficult for higher education because it's baked into the Constitution. Um, uh, we could have a whole conversation about Tabor. And um, other things that are required to be funded before higher ed is funded makes higher education kind of the bill payer over and over and over again. And so that, that's part of the problem. And um, it would take a referendum to turn that around. And uh, a lot of people that have tried and failed over the past few years, I mean, over the last 20, 30 years, are kind of like dogs that have been beat too much when you talk to them, like, oh, it's never gonna happen. I actually think it could happen. I think that, to your point, um, we have a highly educated um, voter base. Uh, business leaders are sick of importing talent because it costs a lot of money. Um, and it's a, it's a much different demographic in the state today that might actually recognize that that's not, it's not a healthy way to um, run, a, run a state budget. Thank you so much for your uh, passion and leadership in helping with our kids. So listening to your average age of the kids and they're working and they've got complex lives age 25, but if we are gonna really get active in politics and get active in values and ethics and leadership and climate change, we gotta get these kids to vote. What are we doing to get these kids oh, registered and to vote? Because that that's question. really important if yeah. we're gonna make a change. MSU Denver proudly has the national record for voter turnout for students. Yeah. And um, college kids across the, across the nation have really amped up voter turnout. They are actually, this generation, you guys, watch out. They are very um, aware, politically active. So it's the apathetic Gen Xers, I guess, like myself. Now you mentioned um, at the beginning of your talk, which your talk is very fascinating, you are a wonderful speaker, um, uh, that you had could give us a little information on what you thought was going on with NATO. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, um, we've been watching this 
Ru you know, Russia thing for years. Um, they invaded Georgia in 2008, uh, invaded Ukraine in 2014, took over Crimea in 2014. So they've been in that area for a long time, but you asked about NATO. And um, I think this is a really important moment for NATO. Uh, you know, for years after the Cold War, there was a steady expansion of NATO. And people then, and even today, have debated that. Would, would that not be provocative to Russia? Why do you have to expand NATO? And that's what Vladimir Putin says. Meanwhile, you, have, you would not be saying that if you lived in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, and it happens, Ukraine. And in all my work in the Pentagon, when we would have NATO meetings in Europe or in the United States, and I would engage with my counterparts and admirals and generals and such like that, um, we would have these sidebars. Inevitably, somebody from Poland or one of the Baltic states would pull me aside and say, you guys gotta get serious about Russia. Russia's coming back. They're gonna come back. And you know, people kind of like, you know, you're kind of overreacting, you know, Russia, don't they understand how important the international system is and how all boats can rise if they just joined our team? And we even had Russian representatives in the NATO council, you know, I mean, we really were trying. Um, and I kind of debated this in my own head, but now I, am f I, I fully agree that those Eastern European who are now thankfully, gratefully, under the protection of the NATO Article 5, they were right. I, I, I don't think that um, expanding NATO provoked Putin. I think Putin always wanted to get back to the way it was. And they knew it, and they were petrified, and they're petrified now. And so this is a big, important moment for NATO. If um, it, it kind of sucks to be Ukraine. They, they're not NATO, and they're not getting the kind of help. We tried to do deterrence by punishment, which is to say, Putin, if you invade Ukraine, we will punish you with sanctions. And guess what he said? Meh. So he's in, and it's going to be really hard to get him out. The question is whether he's going to keep going. And that is why there are American troops and NATO troops on the border in, in the Baltics, in Poland, there's an American aircraft carrier, an Italian aircraft carrier, a French aircraft carrier, and um, eight more destroyers in the Mediterranean and the Adriatic. And um, that will be the tripwire. And if we don't rise to the defense of NATO, NATO is done. And I think that uh, the international system that was carefully crafted and actively managed and materially underwritten by the United States of America for 75 years is also done. So that's it. We can talk more at happy hour. <laughs> a follow-up to that, Ukraine. What do you foresee in the next six weeks, and what do you foresee in the next six months? I think in the next six weeks, you're going to continue to see, um, well, six weeks it could be like dog years in terms of war. Um, you're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna move into, I think, I, th I, I think a lot of us were surprised, actually, um, the, at, at Putin's ambition. I mean, I knew, I was pretty sure he was going to come into the East and try to consolidate what he's been doing there with resistance warfare for the last eight years. I was not anticipating, and most of us weren't, that he was gonna go full on. And it looks pretty clear that he wants a full on, complete occupation of all of Ukraine, not just the East, but all of it. Um, I think he uh, was um, probably surprised at the level of resistance that the Ukrainian military that we've been training for the last eight years um, put up, uh, especially like in Kiev and the airfields and the military um, backlash. So what I think you're going to see is a, 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 a frozen conflict and um, a protracted um, resistance warfare on the part of the Ukrainians like an insurgency, um, and it's going to be ugly for a while. Because economic sanctions aren't necessarily um, going to turn him around. Once he's in, he's in. And then you have Chernobyl. Is there any fear of disaster by nuclear power? I don't know. Possibly. I think, you know, I think the nuclear piece is, 
is one of the reasons why. Um, you know, we used to think that we had international rules and you weren't supposed to invade countries and stuff. Uh, like that's why we went into Kuwait in 1990. Um, and why wouldn't you do this in Ukraine? And the major answer for why you wouldn't do it in Ukraine is because it, it could be the tinderbox for World War III and because Russia has nuclear weapons. And that's the lesson to people who don't like the international system and people who don't like America in particular in the Western liberal, neoliberal um, international order is that if you have nuclear weapons, the rules are different for you. So what you're gonna see is Iran continuing to go full board. You're gonna see um, North Korea and um, um, I hate to say this, but I really do think it's true that um, China is probably going to do to Taiwan what Putin did to Crimea, and it probably will happen after the Paralympics. So that, so there's that. Yeah, Dr. Davidson, Janine, um, on behalf of the club, I want to thank you very much for sharing both a hopeful story and a <laughs> very sobering one. I'll say that. Metro State is very, very lucky to have you. Thank you. And just to turn back to, you know, the the, the educational story you were focused on, just to say, I, like you, I, I see great hope, um, creativity, potential, uh, just brain power among our students. And again, knowing and you that know, you're because there, you're a professor. Yeah, but 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 truly yes. knowing that you have that leadership. Um, at Metro State with a really uh, special group of students is really incredible. So thank you again for sharing that. I also wanted to um, just uh, bring you into a, um, a recognition that uh, the Boulder Rotary Club has long carried on. Um, Boulder Rotary Club together with Rotary International for more than 30 years has been engaged in the effort to eradicate polio. And I think the numbers now are 99.9% .9 there. And on behalf of the club, we are uh, donating 20, 20 shares of or 20 doses of polio vaccine in your name. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>